Hello everyone, it's Charlene Lee. I'm actually broadcasting from London today. So good morning for the people in the UK and Europe. Good, um, sorry, good morning to the people in America and the US and, and the and continents of the North America and South America. Uh, good evening, afternoon to people in Europe. I don't even know what time zone I'm in at this point. So uh, hello to wherever you are. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how to think about silos in organizations. And I've been thinking about this because um, I'm working in a very large organization now, and it's natural for us to have silos that can develop between departments, between geographies, between ranks of people. Um, some other silos that might be out there are, for example, offices, product lines, business units, um, even schedules for people who work in um, different time zones, or even in schedules, if you're working in a manufacturing or a service and hospitality business, they can be silos based on your work schedule. So with all these different silos, well, how do you actually think about working between them? Because silos can be good, but they can also be bad. Uh, so today I wanna to talk a little bit about silos because it's something that every organization comes across at some point in their lives. Um, and leaders have to think about how do silos form in a good way, but also how do silos form in a bad way? And what are the telltale signs to say your silos are developing in a bad way? So to begin, I would love for you to share, um, again, if you have any examples of how you connected silos in your organization. These are, again, departments or regions or any kind of silos that may have existed in your organization if they were starting to go off in the wrong direction, how did you write the ship? How did you fix things so that there were better communications, better collaboration between groups that will naturally form in organizations? So first of all, let's take a look at what are some of the benefits of silos. And some of them are, first of all, when you have a common goal, when you're working towards the same thing, it creates trust, it creates natural collaborations, uh, it creates ways for people to communicate better because you're working on things that are very similar. You're working um, against goals, you have incentives that are aligned, and also because the collaboration and the communications are really strong inside of silos, you produce better work. Silos are also a great place to develop your career. Let's say you're in customer service or in marketing or within a particular product line. It's really easy to see how you can progress up and through the organization. So it fosters career development, training, loyalty, connections, friendships. These are all really positive things about silos. But at the same time, you can have silos that become dysfunctional in organizations. And some of the reasons why silos become uh, so dysfunctional in many ways is because there may be a lack of a company vision. So the silos continue on it's doing a great job. But then when you're trying to figure out like what are we working towards in connection with a completely different department or region or product line, if there isn't a unifying purpose, a mission, a vision, common goals and metrics, then it becomes unclear how you're supposed to work with other organizations how you're supposed to be working and collaborating together. So that underlying why starts to be diminished as opposed to this very strong why and sense of purpose that's aligned with your particular department or silo. Another key reason why it starts breaking down is that there may be competition between different groups for scarce resources. I, I heard from one leader how they, they were running a a retail store, a department store, and they wanted to increase sales, have this common goal. But the way they did it was to put in place a competition where the team, it would be jewelry or accessories or men's or children's, whichever one increased their sales the most would get a prize at the end of the month. As you can imagine, the competition now was pitting one team versus another versus collaborating together to say, how can we raise the overall sales of the entire department store rather than just individual groups within that store? And that led to all sorts of dysfunctional behaviors between these groups. 
And then the other reason why dysfunctions may arise over time is that, frankly, the management team, the executives, let them get away with it. You could have a leader who say, okay, I, I may be better off as, we may be better off as an organization to work together, collaborate, but that takes me time away from my internal departmental goals. So I'm not going to spend any time collaborating with other silos, other departments. I am just going to focus on my success. So everything else, forget about it. I'm going to make sure that I am, we are successful because I have no other incentives. And the executives let that leader get away with it. So I wanted to just, just one of the things I did want to talk about next is how do you think about fixing these, these dysfunctions that can arise within silos? So I see a couple different uh, comments coming in from people over here with an interesting comment, pointing out commonalities in purpose among disparate thing connected and coordinated. That's how Lynn to break across these silos, connect them. We all have corporate values and missions and ideas and customer growth. A key thing there, Lynn, you're absolutely right. Customer um, and then you, when you have these common goals, you can use them as a starting point. So thank you so much for sharing that, Lynn, from your experience. They also share is that silos are tribal and easily seduced by group thing. And you think about it, Jay, you raise a really uh, good point um, that when silos can also uh, cause a trauma, some sort of uh, that happens in an organization. Think about acquisitions. When you acquire a new company, the employees who are in the old company may, they may group together, form their old trauma because huge influx of new people coming in and they, they don't know who they are. They don't know how to trust them, form this silo of old people versus new people. And it's hard to break across that. Uh, so tribe means safety. So there's a lot of safety among knowing who are similar, have common values, common goals, common experiences as you do. So these are great points. And Jay just kind of mentioned just a good prize is maybe stake lives and also points out if you haven't seen the movie with play Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, a classic example of how just not create necessarily team environment and pitting people against each other. So great examples there of, of how to think about connecting these groups. So I want to move on to when you're thinking about breaking down silos. What I've been working with leaders is instead of breaking down or tearing down these silos, it becomes really hard to wrap your mind around that because again, these silos have a very strong function. There's an organizational structure for better or for worse that organizes the work to be done. There's a logic to having a marketing department. There's a logic to having a region there's a logic to having a particular business unit of product lines. There's a logic of having uh, groups of people at different levels for training and advancement purposes. And instead of thinking about breaking down and getting breaking down, getting rid of these departments, I really encourage people to think about building and breaking and building windows between these silos windows so that greater communication and collaboration and coordination and knowledge sharing can flow between these silos. That way you're retaining the benefits of these different groups. You have all the benefits of collaboration, of common goals, of commonalities that naturally exist because of the organizational structure. And, and you have this free flow of information and particularly the free flow of information about your customers that flow seamlessly across all of these departments. So when we focus on building windows between silos rather than breaking down silos, it looks really, really different. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, when we, we actually have this free flow of information, we make better decisions. Again, the decisions can bring the best to bear of what every single silo has that expertise, that experience, that execution that you have within a silo. 
but it also brings all of the data with it and shares it broadly with everyone. So everyone has the best data to make decisions with. It can also boost productivity because when you have uh, this sharing of experiences and best practices from one place to another, you're experiencing and sharing the experiences and expertise across all these different groups. But that expertise is being developed in those groups too as well. And then finally, I think that the last part about the windows back and forth, you can actually have people move back and forth or a different region, learn everything about that and bring that expertise back again. So how do you actually put windows between silos? Well, I, I went in the past week, a, a lot of research uh, about how to actually do this. And it was interesting. You had some definite commonality things like setting common goals, having shared visions. But when I broke down to it, the number one thing, the number one thing that I've seen across all the research and also from my own experiences is that it has to start with leadership. If the leaders are not invested in having these open organizations, having their departments, having their regions, whichever silos they are, quote, in charge of and in control and command, if they're not committed to also being able to set those aside and have and moving it from my department to our organization, if the leadership isn't invested in that, nothing else matters. I hear so many executive teams that say, oh yeah, we can't stand these silos. I want to go break down, but you all go first. I'll see how that happens. So there's this vested interest amongst the leaders to intrinsically not trust the other leadership team to actually build these windows in between them. So this is where that trust, that shifting from my department is part. And that has to with a commitment to the organization's vision. This is again, the vision, the purpose and mission also happen, but it has at that executive level. When there are silos inside of organizations, these dysfunctional silos, it's almost always a reflection of the top leadership not being in trust with each other. So one of the, the most important things is to make sure that the leadership team is absolutely aligned in this. So one of the um, other things to do, the second thing to do is to build these personal teams. And this is where the windows start looking really different. They look no more like, they're not so much windows, but they're actual tunnels going back and forth, these bridges in between these departments. And you have these cross-functional teams. And the reason why they're effective is we can say, let's set common goals so that the marketing department, the sales department, and the service department are now all aligned against common goals. Well, you have to start someplace start making those common goals. You can't do it necessarily at the departmental level because there isn't that trust. So with cross-functional teams, it could just be a project. It could be people back to share that expertise. But over time, you'll develop some common goals, maybe not all common goals, some common goals where you're dependent on the other groups to be able to succeed. And what if this requires it is more of a systems thinking approach to looking at these goals, recognizing how the silos are all interconnected with each other, that we cannot be successful without the other teams also being successful. So instead of thinking about, oh my goodness, we have common goals, so they're going to drag me down. Instead, how do I, how it, recognizing that the only way I can be successful is that the other teams are successful too as well. Now, this can be aligned with common incentives and motivations, but it's also much more around things like recognition, all the soft goals, as well as the monetary goals that need to be shared. I see a lot of comments coming in, but I want to finish with the third type of third way to be thinking about again, these silos work much more effectively. And this is the key part about putting the windows in place. Uh, this is about making sure that information sharing is happening making sure knowledge and the data is flowing as seamless as possible. 
uh, and that then creates opportunities for knowledge, but also for collaboration um, and creativity. And in the end, that builds trust and confidence that we can all work together. Now, the reason why I think windows are so important is it may be just two people literally yelling at each other from one department to the other, or literally tossing information back and forth in batches to each other to be able to share that. It's not going to look pretty. It's going to be cumbersome but at least the information is being exchanged. And over time, when you see what use information is flowing between the departments, then you can put more pulley ropes and then eventually pipes and then big, huge pipes and eventually just free flowing of information flying back and forth between the departments. So this is really much more around uh, looking at uh, not uh, common taxonomy economies, cross-department collaboration platforms, uh, assigning cross-department liaison who go back and forth, who are responsible for making sure that this communication is happening. And in some cases, it may even be physically moving people back at work from one place to another, co-locating them, uh, making sure that they have these tools virtually or physically to be near each other, working on the same platforms together. And of course, putting in place a metrics to understand, are these teams actually working together in the right way and monitoring how much knowledge is actually being transferred for? So that's, that's the key thing that I have for today, which is one of the most important things you can do around this is to think about what is the most effective information, data, the knowledge, that can be shared so that that collaboration can happen. And moving that forth, even if it's really cumbersome to do. So I have a few um, comments here. Uh, the Yahia says, it's based on the company culture um, and those who don't like to work in those environments is a key reason why these departments also these silos form. Um, and Jay has a couple comments here. Windows are still boundaries and you have a really good point there, Jay. I love this. Think about the grim fairy tales and poor maidens looking out of windows, unable to connect the outside world. And I think, again, that's a great example. But at the same time, they were able to start a start kit because they do eventually are able to escape out of them um, and also connect with the world. But the idea is how do you build ladders, those bridges between these silos, between these organizations? and to make sure that people are able to connect on the most important things that are going to make a difference. Uh, so I think one of the, the ways to think about this is also, if you have a pretty healthy organization, how do you keep silos from becoming dysfunctional in the first place? And one of the things that you can do, again, some of those actions that I talk about Having these common touch points, finding the places where we, we just naturally connect. Uh, for example, ha having recurring interdepartmental meetings, formal meetings, informal get-togethers so people can get to know each other, breakout section, uh, sessions, uh, work. You can find ways for people, create these bonding experiences, swapping people back and forth, uh, Another good thing I saw one company do is as people are joining, they do a rotation through every single department, regardless of where they sit. So they understand how every part of the organization works and also form these connections, these deep connections with people in each of the departments around the organization. Uh, another way to keep these dysfunctional silos from forming in the first place identify where there are information blockages. How the places where people could use information but can't get to it. Find where those frustration points are. Listen to your customers who say, it's crazy, I call one department, they get transferred and keep the same information over again. A natural way to be thinking, how do we actually break through some of those information blockages that form these department silos in the first place? And then finally, I think more than anything else, it's rebuilding and investing in trust in the organ. If you're starting to sense, and we have that spider sense, that some organizations are forming these silos, these tribal teams, 
to protect themselves, to be safe because of some dysfunction. They go right to it, call on the executives leading those teams and say, there's something going on here. You may be nice to each other, but are you being honest with each other? And this can come from some bad projects that didn't work well. Then make sure you have really good post-mortem meetings. These post uh, meetings that are are held not to just uh, you know just kind of quickly review things, but say what went wrong, how do we fix that, how do we address the the potential bad feelings that are there, how do we clear between all of us, how do we be honest with each other, create that safe space so we can be honest with each other, so we can clear, because if we're not clear with each other. We will retreat back to our individual groups, our departments, our silos, and put up brick walls so that we are not hurt again. But if we're clear, we'll tear down those walls. We'll make sure that there's nothing in the way. Those silos and and departments can still exist, but those windows, those pathways, those bridges are now clear again so we can go back and forth in a frictionless way. So... If you think about this this thing, and and we'll we'll talk a little bit later in a few weeks about how do you give good feedback. I've had some other um, live streams that I've had in the past about giving good feedback, creating a culture of feedback and sharing. Um, Feed forward, think about it, the ways that you can get that feedback about something in the past, but think about the advice you can think about going and and, uh, moving forward to become even better at everything that we're trying to do. And then finally, most importantly, acknowledging that we're all all in the same part at this moment because we want to retreat back to the safety of our silos. But if anything, we need to put the the foot forward and put ourselves forward. I know it's not in the best, um, we're not in a good place right now, but we have to remember we're all the same with the same goal, purpose, and mission. We have the same vision we want to accomplish. Let's clear the air, connect, reconnect, um, find ways to build that trust again so that we can move forward. All right, so that was a lot to talk about today. Um, I just have a couple other comments here. Um, Let's see, Latoria has a comment. I found that a great deal of executives don't actually have the leadership skills or emotional intelligence to break down. Latoria, you are so right. And... What happens, I find, especially in these these fairly dysfunctional organizations, is that the executives have not been given a reason to do this, to do this well, to face the really hard discussions that they have to have. Their top leader just let slide, the board doesn't isn't aware of it, or it just chooses to ignore it, and this is this is let it continue. So when I can see organs that are functioning really well, the ones that have strong sense of purpose, of mission, of vision, and of values. They use those tools to align everybody against this idea of us, of, of we, for them, and us. And the them is not necessarily competition, but it's people within your own organization. So it's 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 really interesting to me when I go in do the 360 interviews across your organization and people would tell me you know I just have to be honest with what's really on. and they're they're talking about all the other leaders then it, it's a sign there is not trust so I think this this type of um, emotional um, intelligence but more importantly the leaders to a common goal common vision. It, again, the time I see this, it's happening at that executive level, and there's a reluctance to have people actually do that. Um, again, Jay has some great comments here. Emotional commitment um, is both side of organization that's re- replaced by interchangeable executives. Again, this is a revolving door of people coming in and out. If you're on the outs, we'll get somebody else in. We'll see if they can play the game better than the person before. Again, really functional organizations have people who stay for years in place. They have these strong relationships. They have that commitment to purpose and vision. And you don't see this revolving door constantly of people who are churning in and out. Uh, let me comment here. Conflict is like a human body. 
and each part is far more independent, it is sorry, far more dependent upon the other parts than is apparent at first glance. Harmony across all parts generates health, growth, and endurance effort, and it is certainly worthwhile. Uh, thank you, Lynn, for that great example and, and um, the, uh, the analogy of an organization to a body. You have all these different groups, um, these parts of the body that are so important. And they each have a function. They each have a purpose. And it's all united together into this one big system called the body or the organization. And no more important than the other. One part couldn't do it by themselves without the other. So reminding people about how important that is, that we're all pulling in the same direction really so that's what I have for today. I, again, I, I use this analogy of instead of breaking down silos, instead of trying to get everybody to be the same, to just erase the departments and to really from the very beginning thinking about how do we make sure that those bridges are there? I, here's one way to think about your organization. If you could just wave your magic wand and rewind back to when you started the organization, if you're an entrepreneur, or if you could just take a magic wand and erase everything, start over again, how would you build up the company? Would you have departments like marketing, sales, and service? Well, most likely. Put all of them so that there's better information sharing, much better exchange of expertise, much better communication, and these bridges, these windows between these departments, between these silos so that you don't have these dysfunctions. About all things that lead to dysfunctional organizations and silos that build them up the trauma experiences that, that remove trust. And you do everything possible to constantly, constantly ensure that while you have these departments, strong departments, that they're not being and pitting each other as tribes against each other, but instead united at that experience executive team against very specific goals. So that when the, the inevitable stresses come up around departments and differences, you can set them aside, you can take time to breathe, remember what we're here for and work through those differences. So I hope this is helpful. Um, I am excited to hear as always, please reach out to me by email through the various social media channels. I monitor them constantly with me and my team. Would love to hear from you about how you're thinking about these silos, your experiences, because this is how I do my research. And I'm particularly interested in, in organizations that are able to do a reset, a restart of the organizational structure. And in particular, as they build that uh, leadership and emotional intelligence and leadership skills to very organizations. So I will be taking that off because of Memorial Day. Um, I will be um, coming back on June. Sorry, wrong dates here. <laughs> I should have edited this a little bit. I was um, editing on the fly. June 7th when I'm back on at 9 o'clock time. We're talking about the optimistic leader. And I really like this because I've been working with some leaders who are not just optimistic. They're so positive, they actually create something called toxic positivity. So there's a fine line between being an optimistic, talking about your, your vision, but also to the point where you're not being realistic and your positivity is creating a toxic culture. So talk about how to avoid that, what's that fine line, and also how to foster optimism in yourself, your leadership team, and your organization. So I'll see you in about two weeks on June 7th at 9 o'clock Pacific time. Take care. Have a great day.